morning, everyone. And welcome to the 17th Annual Risky Business Prevention Conference. For those of you who have been here before, we're happy to see you again. For those of you, if this is your first time, we welcome you. I know you will certainly enjoy the program. It's going to prove to be very um, delightful, and uh, I think you'll really, really enjoy our speaker for the day. Um, at, I am Sherry Osborne. I am uh, an employee at the Carroll County Health Department, one of the health educators, and the co-chairman of the Risky Business Prevention Conference, along with Linda Auerbach. Linda's back there talking to Bob, so Linda, wave your hand. So Linda has, has just really been phenomenal with this conference. I also, at this time, would like to thank Bob and his staff here at Martin's. So, if any of the staff members are here, take a bow and thank you. I would like to introduce the keynote, keynote speaker who I understand will be presenting to you this morning and then again this afternoon. I'm really kind of working her hard. Yes, we are. Are we paying her good? We are. Okay. <laughs> I'd like to introduce Heather Higgins, who is a licensed certified social worker clinical. She is the director of training and development, and I'll talk about her uh, organization in just a minute. Heather is a director of training and development in the Upside Down organization. That's kind of interesting. She has been practicing social work for over a decade in Baltimore, Maryland, focusing her efforts on working with children and families. Heather obtained her BA from Loyola University and her Master in Social Work from the University of Maryland, Baltimore. Heather began working for the Children's Guild in 2004 on their clinical leadership management team, or uh, clinical leadership team, serving first as a clinical director of the special education school and then as a director of the OMHC. Now, I I think I should know what that stands for, but what is OMHC? Outpatient Mental Health Center. Okay, Outpatient Mental Health Center. I should have known that. <laughs> she has been with the Upside Down organization since 2008. Heather began her career working with children and adults with developmental delays while she was in high school and has continued to serve individuals in need ever since. Heather has worked with children and families in a multitude of settings, including residential care, uh, school, foster care, outpatient, and inpatient hospitals. Currently, Heather oversees the training department at her organization uh, under upside down organization, supervising our cert certified trainers. She can be found presenting interactive workshops and keynote addresses nationwide, like today, to child-serving professionals and families. Heather provides energetic and engaging training in a variety of areas, including poverty in the brain, gender differences in the classroom, uh, gender differences in the classroom, the teen brain, ADHD, and bullying. Born and raised in New York, Heather has been calling Baltimore home for the past two decades. Now I've got a little picture up here, I don't know if you all have it, but it's a picture of Heather standing here like this with a big smile on her face. And she's got two things in each hand. To me, they look like brains. Is that what they are? Yeah. Oh, this is gonna be good today. <laughs> so I would like to invite Heather up here to get your day started. I want to take a moment to um, situate your chairs so you can see better. Please feel free to do that. So just take a moment and get your chairs turned around. everyone. 
you certainly just heard the very long version of my bio. That's not usually the one I send out, but you've got it all. So I have very little I have to tell you about myself now. Uh, but it is truly an honor to be here, and I greatly appreciate being invited to spend the day with you. Hopefully we'll have uh, a few laughs together, because coming to a conference for seven hours without laughing is not good for anyone. But hopefully, the more importantly, we'll learn a lot of uh, useful information that you can take home with you and start applying right away. So let's get started. But before we get started, we have to do a little brain check. We have to see how our brains are this morning. Because I've heard that some of you drove here from very far away. Some of you may live in this community. But wherever you came from, we were in cars, we were in traffic, we had to drop kids off at daycare, feed our dogs, walk our dogs, and we have to make sure that our brains are present and ready to learn. So we're gonna do a quick brain check just to get ourselves a little bit grounded this morning. So, if you have your legs crossed, if you would please just uncross them and put them right in front of you. If you happen to have a foot or ankle injury, please do not do this activity. Although I bet we do have some medical professionals in the audience, I am not one. So, with your legs uncrossed, if you would just take your right foot and lift it just a few inches off the ground. Just a few inches. Once your right foot is lifted off the ground, start making clockwise circles. Need some help? Look at your watch. Clockwise circles with your right foot. Once you're doing that, lift your right hand up in the air and point at me. I know it's rude, it's okay. Point at me. Now, with that finger, start drawing the number six. Keep going clockwise with your foot, start drawing the number six. Now look down. If it didn't work, try it again. I hear a lot of laughter, which means it worked for most of you. If it didn't work for you again, try it again. It should happen. So what happened? Your foot started going the other way, right? OK. Nothing is wrong with you if your foot started going the other way. That means your brain is working. If your foot didn't go the other way, have some more coffee and then try it again. What's happening is your brain has connections, real life connections, not theoretical connections, but actual physical neuronal connections. And those connections are real and they guide our lives. So I think most of us are adults in this room, which means that most of us have been drawing the number six for quite some time. Decades upon decades, we've all been drawing the number six. We don't even have to think about it. I ask you to draw number six, you do it right away. That connection is extremely strong, which means it's myelinated. These are all words we're gonna go over as we progress today, but myelinated means that that connection is strong. Just like if you drive to the same office for work every morning, you don't have to use a map to get there. You don't have to put it in your GPS. You just know how to do it. It's an automatic connection, just like drawing the number six. So I asked you to draw the number six. Your brain naturally goes to that connection, and your foot wants to follow. Your brain doesn't like doing two opposite things. And one of the hardest jobs that every one of us has to do if we work with children or are raising children, one of the hardest things that we have to do is help them to unlearn things that don't work. Learning is hard, but unlearning is much harder. Now we could sit here until 3.30 this afternoon and unlearn how to go the opposite way with our foot. And I'm quite certain that each of you would be able to do it. But if you came back here next Tuesday, I bet you'd go right back to doing it the other way because that connection is really strong. Now think about the young people that you work with, care about, live with, are raising. How many of the young people that you know have learned things that don't work for them? Have learned that when I'm angry, I'm gonna get in a fight. When I'm angry, I'm gonna get high. When I'm upset, I'm gonna drink. And that works for me. Not just young people, adults as well. And when we make those connections over and over and over again, they become very real. Just like the connection to drawing the number six. And it is very, very hard to unlearn that. Think about young people you know who may have grown up in homes where they hear every day that they're not as smart as their sister. 
They're not as athletic as their brother. They're never going to amount to anything. And when you hear that day after day after day, that becomes a real connection too. And we have to help them unlearn that. When they come into our schools and our hospitals and our community centers and our group homes and wherever it is that you interact with children, we have to help them unlearn and break those connections that don't work for them. Okay, so hopefully everybody's brains are up and ready to learn and we're all grounded and present. Let me just tell you a little bit about where I'm coming from and who I am. I know you got my bio, so I won't talk about me, but I'll talk a little bit about the Upside Down organization. So the Upside Down organization is part of the Children's Guild. The Children's Guild is a nonprofit organization. Our headquarters are in Baltimore, Maryland. And what the Upside Down organization is, is it's the training branch of the Children's Guild. And so we travel internationally. We've actually been to three countries. And we've been to, I believe, we're up to 47 states. 45, I think it says on the next slide, but we keep going around. So I think we've been in almost, almost every state since we began in uh, 2007. And what we do is we travel all around and we help adults help kids. So our message through all of our workshops is twofold. One, understanding how the brain works. Because when we understand how the brain works, things make sense and life gets easier. Now I know we all learn different systems and theories in our jobs, and I'm not here to make your life more complicated. My goal is to make it easier, because when we understand how the brain works, things just make more sense. And the other common theme through all of our workshops is children. And so we're constantly making that connection with how the brain works, what's going on developmentally with kids, and how do we marry those two ideas together to help adults help kids. We actually do the things that we're talking about in the programs at the Children's Guild, so we do applied research meaning in our group homes, in our foster homes, we put these ideas to practice so we know that they work. All of our marketing is word of mouth, so if you enjoy this presentation, please share it with your friends and colleagues. <clears throat> and oh, finally, we are a nonprofit, and so all of the proceeds we get from any of our trainings go right back to the children in our programs. The Children's Guild, as I mentioned, the nonprofit, we do many different things throughout the state of Maryland. We have four schools. We have two non-public level five alternative schools, one in Prince George's County and one in Baltimore City. And then we also currently run two charter schools, one in Anne Arundel County and one in Baltimore City. And those are called the Monarch Academies. Um, I actually, starting July 1st, will be at Monarch Academy full time as their behavior specialist. And so I'll be doing training on the side and I'll be in the school full time. We also run group homes. We have two for boys, one for girls in Baltimore City. We have a fairly large foster care program. We have an outpatient mental health center, that's the OMHC. And then we also run an after school program at our charter schools. And so all of our programs through the Children's Guild work directly with kids. At the Upside Down organization, we work with the adults who work with the kids. And the philosophy through all of our programs is transformation education. And what transformation education is, is it's a mindset, it's a way of thinking, and that we're really taking the ideas behind neuroscience, brain-based learning, brain-based theory, and marrying that with anthropology. And the anthropology piece is the culture, the community, the environment. And let me show you what that looks like. And so here you have, in the center, a very traditional public school. You'll see there are nothing hanging on the wall. This is a real picture I took in an elementary school last April. There is nothing hanging on the walls. That's not what little kid brains want. Little kid brains want to see what they've done. They want to see their work. They want to see their artwork. They want to see their successes. And so if you look on either side of that center picture, you'll see some of the hallways at our schools. And in our schools, we have a big belief in art and culture and displaying children's work. So there you can see some of the differences. Here you have the entranceway, and then you have one of our cafeterias. Again, you can see how they're very different than what you may find in a traditional school setting. Our kids don't eat at long lunch tables. Our kids eat at round tables, more like you do in a home. And the same ideas carry through to all of our group homes as well. 
So if you want more information about that, you can visit our websites. But I'll stop talking about what the Children's Guild is now. You already heard all about me, so I won't go through that again either. But enough about me. Let's learn a little bit about you. So hopefully, some of you recognize the guy up here with, next to me. I'll tell you a true story. I do a workshop called My Awesome Brain. My Awesome Brain is a workshop for kids. And I go into elementary and middle schools, and um, I teach kids about their brains. And I still do a lot of the same activities that I do with adults. And I put this slide up this winter, and a little girl in the front row, a little sixth grade girl, raised her hand and said, Miss Heather, is that your dad? <laughs> True story. So for any of you that may be very young in the audience, that is not my dad. That is Mr. Rogers. Um, and if any of you grew up around the same time that I did, he was a staple of your Saturday mornings. And I remember I love Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And if you think back to one of the key ingredients of that show, it was taking time to stop and greet your neighbors. And sometimes life gets so busy, and we get so involved in getting from point A to point B, and we're texting and we're talking on the phone, we can't even take time to talk to the woman behind the cash register because we've got to talk on the phone at the same time. And sometimes we get so caught up that we forget how important it is to take time to be present, and to say hello to the people around us. So in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to participate in a very short activity. This is going to be a two-minute activity. And here's how it'll work. In a, two minutes, your challenge is to greet the people at your table. If you already know them, just say hello. If you don't know them, let them know who you are, why you're here, and then there's another piece. You're going to share with your neighbors, your neighbors are your table, something that you are grateful for right now. It can be as small or as grand as you wish, but something that you are grateful for this morning. So your challenge is trying to do all that in just about two minutes. I'll stop you right around two minutes and we'll come back together. All right, you may begin. Okay, please wrap up and come on back together. All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. It's always a good sign when it takes two or three reminders. That means you're all engaged in talking. When everybody's quiet after 60 seconds, I get nervous. So this is wonderful. Welcome back. Hopefully you had a chance to get to know your neighbors a little bit. And now I do this activity for two reasons. The first one I already explained to you. It's very important to take time out of our day to greet our neighbors, to make ourselves feel emotionally safe. Now I don't believe that any of you feel really unsafe at your tables right now, but Doing that activity increases emotional safety. And one of the things that neuroscience has helped us to learn is that learning will not occur until safety occurs. And that same thing is true for adults and children. When we feel unsafe, whether that be physical safety or emotional safety, it is very hard to learn. It is very hard to pay attention, to focus, if we're worried about the person sitting next to us, and we're going, who is this guy? Why is he sitting so close to me? Or, ah, oh, that woman looks so familiar. Where did I meet her? I just want to have a chance to ask her who she is. Now you've had that chance. Now you can focus on the information being shared with you. And now think about the young people that we work with again. How often do kids start school in the middle of the year? Right? They move from school to school. Perhaps if they're children in care, they're moving from foster home to group home, and they're starting school in April, and they don't know anybody in their class, but everybody else already knows each other. How important is it to make sure that that young person feels emotionally safe? Most schools are really good at the physical safety. We show them where the restrooms are, and where the nurse's office is. We do fire drills, but sometimes we take for granted how important that emotional safety is. So that was one reason we do that activity. The other reason is that talking about things that you are grateful for, even just thinking about them, changes your brain. Let me prove it to you. What you see on the slides behind me 
are SPECT scans, S-P-E-C-T, SPECT scans. And if you happen to have an extra $3,000 in your wallet, you can go get one. <laughs> they are not covered by insurance. Uh, but they're pretty amazing things. They are done at Amen Clinics by Daniel Amen and his team. There happens to be an Amen Clinic in Northern Virginia if you're very interested in following up on this. But what a SPECT scan does in very layman's terms is it takes an image of your brain and it shows you where the brain is working. So if it's working, it's colored in. If it's not working, it ends up looking like a hole. Now, be very clear, it is not a hole. You do not have a hole in your brain, but it looks like a hole in the images. So just to help you understand, those areas that look like holes are parts of the brain that are turned off, just like a light switch. Good news is we can turn them back on. So what you're looking at are two scans of the same brain. This is a very typically functioning, healthy, 34-year-old woman. She has no brain injuries, no brain abnormalities. And in the first scan, which would be the scan on your left, in the first scan, she was asked to think of things that she was grateful for. And if you can see those slides, especially those of you up front, you can see that, that is a very nice looking brain. It's all colored in. And that's what happens when we think about, talk about, or imagine even doing, engaging in the things that make us feel grateful. Our brain loves that. And our brain lights up and it's all turned on. Meaning we have access to all of the parts of our brain. Now a few hours after that first scan, that same woman was given another scan. And this time, she was asked to think about hateful, awful, stressful things. And the reality is that all of us have stress in our lives. And all of us have bad days, and days when we want to be focusing on something, but we're really focusing on the stuff that makes us stressed out. And when we're thinking about that stressful stuff, parts of our brain actually turn off, just like that light switch meaning we don't have access to those areas of our brain, which makes learning hard, paying attention, focusing, sitting still, all of those things that we want to be doing today are much more challenging if we don't have access to all of our brain. So I give you your first free intervention. Thinking of things you're grateful for turns your brain back on. For the young people that you work with and care about, when they are stressed, the same thing happens to them. Now, thinking about things that make you feel grateful does not cure stress and anxiety disorders, but it gives you that extra little boost of what we call serotonin. And we'll talk more about serotonin later, but it's our serenity chemical. It's what makes us feel calm and comfortable and serene. And without serotonin, it is very hard to learn. If we don't feel calm and serene, again, very hard for human beings to pay attention and learn, which makes school really, really hard for people that have excessive amounts of stress. So hopefully by engaging in that little activity, now your brain looks more like the brain on the left than the brain on the right, and you too are ready to learn. One of the things I forgot to mention earlier, a little housekeeping piece, is that we will be taking a formal break about halfway through the morning, so in about an hour, a little less than an hour from now. We'll be taking a formal break. Uh, it'll be 15 minutes. If my schedule doesn't work for your body, I understand. So please feel free to take a break whenever you need to. If you need to stand up and stretch or use the restroom, get some coffee, please feel free. I understand that there are still beverages and a few snacks in the back. Uh, so it doesn't bother me at all. And do what's best for your body. And the same thing happens to the kids. If any of you, how many of you are educators, teachers, classroom teachers, administrators, principals? Same thing for kids. When we ask kids to sit for 90 minutes, you lost them. Somewhere around however old they are. One minute times their age. So say you're working with 15 year olds. After about 15 minutes of you lecturing, you're gonna lose most of those kids. That's the attention span for most people. Now it's even less for children with ADHD. So what does that mean? Does that mean every 15 minutes you have to take a bathroom break? Absolutely not. What that means is be aware of that. As you are providing information to your classroom, be aware of about how old they are. 
at about that many minutes, make sure you're doing something to differentiate the way that you're providing instruction. For example, let's say I had been lecturing on the brain for 15 minutes, and I said, okay, wow, that's about all I've got. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we've been talking for 15 minutes, you've been listening to me. Now turn to a neighbor and tell them something fascinating you've learned so far today. That's all it takes. For the younger little kids, all right, boys and girls, we've been learning all about our bodies for 15 minutes. Now I want you to draw a picture of what you think the body looks like. That's it. You just want the brain to shift the way that it's learning if you want to sustain attention. So what does that mean for today? You will not hear me lecture for hours and hours on end because nobody likes to learn that way. So we'll be talking, we'll be sharing, and there's a reason for it because that's how the brain learns best when we differentiate the way we provide instruction. All right, back to the content. So we've looked a little bit at the brain. You've heard me mention the brain many times already. Why do we care so much? Why does my organization invest all of this time and energy and people in the brain? Because the brain is involved in every single thing that we do, absolutely everything. And yet for many of us in the field of education or the field of counseling, no one taught us about the brain. We went through, we got master's degrees, we have all nice letters after our names, right? We're certified in this and that, but we don't know how the brain works. Now there are exceptions, certainly. There are programs that let you take an elective in neuroscience, but very few make it mandatory. And yet when we send our children to school and we have educators, we have counselors working with them on a daily basis, the primary organ of the human body they are working with is the brain. And yet, many people in those fields don't have a really solid understanding of how the brain works. Now, by 3.30 today, that will change for all of you. All of you will have a basic understanding, but please be aware, I am not a neuroscientist. And I am a social worker, so I'm going to present to you brain information in a social work friendly way not in a neuroscience way, which means when you leave here today, you'll be able to take it with you, use it, teach it to someone else. So the brain's involved in absolutely everything we do, and the brain is everywhere. All right, turn on the Today Show in the morning, Dr. Oz, open up a health magazine, even open up the magazine on Southwest Airlines. Every single month, I fly a lot, every single month there's at least three or four references to the brain in the Southwest Airline magazine. Next time you fly, look for it. And when you're looking for it, you'll start to see that it truly is everywhere. The field of neuroscience is blossoming every day. There's constantly new information coming out all about how brains work, what helps, what hurts, medications, substance abuse, elderly, babies, everything. The field of neuroscience is truly a fascinating department to be studying right now. It really is blossoming every day. In fact, few summers ago, it's actually been three years now, I spent nine days at a brain conference in San Antonio, Texas. You're only here till 3.30 today. <laughs> All right. Imagine nine days of learning about the brain from nine to five every day. It was interesting, but by day eight, I didn't care anymore about the brain. <laughs> and so I go to the San Antonio airport on my way home, and I go to the bookstore. And I just wanted to find some trashy novel. You know, with a hot man on a horse, <laughs> riding off into the sunset, bare-chested, you know. You know what I wanted, right? And I go into the bookstore looking for my trashy romance novel. And this is what I found. <laughs> yes, the brain is everywhere. But I think it's some pretty exciting stuff. And I hopefully that you'll make some fun connections today as we go through and learn about the brains. So where in the world did the title for this workshop come from? Giving a fish a bath. Actually came from my colleague Frank Cross's eighth grade teacher. That's who Margaret Baldwin is. So if you Google her and look for some famous person, she's an eighth grade teacher in Omaha, Nebraska. And Frank was working on this workshop a few years ago. And he said, you know, I'm going to ask Mrs. Baldwin why is it that she's been teaching eighth grade for over 30 years? Eighth grade is a tough group, right? That's a tough age. You've got 13, 14 year olds. Why in the world have you stayed with middle school for 30 years? And this was her answer. This is what she told him. That the joy of seeing what 
you do produces later in life. The benefits of what you do is a lot like giving that fish a bath. They don't appreciate it at the time you do it, but later in life, it's amazing to see what happens. And so that's where giving a fish a bath came from, the title of this workshop. All right, so I think we've been listening to me talk again long enough. Let's have a little fun. We're going to play a little game. And this game, now we've got many people in this audience, so traditionally I'd have you stand up and move around. We can't do that in here. So we're going to do the seated version, a seated version of a game that I call Whip Around. And here's how, I hear some, some sounds. How many of you have seen an upside down organization pre pre presentation before? All right, so you know what Whip Around is. We're going to do the seated version of this game. So here's how it will work. I will read you a true or false statement. I would like you to decide on your own, independently, if you believe the answer is true or false. If you think it's true, you're going to secretly, in your lap, make a T. T for true. If you think it's false, you're going to make an X. X for false. You're going to hide your answer until you hear the command, whip around. And when I say whip around, you're going to show the people at your table your answer. Now, imagine if you were standing up, you'd be back to back and you'd be jumping. For space reasons, we won't do that. So you're just going to show the people at your table your answer. Now, here's where it gets fun. If everyone at your table has the same answer, celebrate. <laughs> celebrate however you feel fit. Right? It's summertime, school's out. Celebrate however you feel fit. Now, you might feel like that's corny and weird, and you're like, mm, I don't know these people. I'm not celebrating with them. But here's the reason we do this. The more emotion involved in learning, the better chance it will be remembered. So the more emotion that you show, the better chance you will remember that question and answer. So if you all have the same answer, celebrate. If you have different answers, just oh, oh, commiserate together. I don't care if you get it right or wrong. That's not important because your brain will remember if you got it wrong as well, which means you'll know the correct answer. So I'll read you the question. You decide on your own. When I say whip around, you show your neighbors the answer. Correct, celebrate. Different, don't celebrate. I will then tell you the correct answer, and we will move on. There are five questions. OK. I would say any questions, but I don't think I'd be able to hear you. So hopefully, everybody got the instructions. Here we go. Question. Number one, true or false, telling teens that they are smart may negatively impact academic performance. Telling teens they are smart may negatively impact academic performance. Answer on your own and whip around. Okay, a couple tables, a couple tables. A couple tables had all the same answer. It was pretty quiet. It was pretty quiet, so I'm guessing a lot of tables had different answers. The correct answer is true. True. We will talk about this question in much greater detail later this morning. And this has to do with Carol Dweck's work on mindset. But the answer is true. We don't want to tell kids they're smart. We don't want to tell kids they're not smart either. We just want to change the words that we use. And I'll explain that in much greater detail. OK, number two. Number two, on your own, true or false, adolescent lying is a direct result of bad morals, lack of ethics, and poor parenting. Answer on your own, and whip around. Even some people standing up. That oh, we got glasses. We got people standing up. I like it. I like it. This is excellent. I don't think there's anybody else in this building. We're good. We're fine. All right. Excellent learning there. We're gonna make those strong connections. The correct answer to that is false. False. Adolescent lying actually has to do with what's going on in the brain. Now, not all adolescent lying. Some adolescent lying is very purposeful, but. There is quite a bit of lying that happens, and it's explained by a process called blossoming. 
I'm going to explain that to you later too. Okay, number three, on your own, true or false, most of the content that teens learn in school is directly relevant to their lives outside of school. <laughs> true or false, and whip around. All right, a lot, of, a lot of matching answers on that one. A lot of matching answers. That answer is surprisingly false. Surprisingly, shockingly, when interviewed, most teenagers said that what they learn in school has nothing to do with their real lives. We may think it does, but they don't think it does. Okay, next question. On your own, true or false, the adolescent brain is like an adult brain, but with several years less experience. All right, and whip around. <laughs> back here is really, they're thinking all the same way. I like it. That was a little tricky, but that answer is false. False. The adolescent brain is very different from the adult brain. There are things that happen in adolescence. There are four fundamentals that happen during adolescence that have nothing to do with the adult brain, that make this time of development very, very unique. And again, I'll tell you about that all later. Okay, and last one. Number five, last one, on your own, true or false, the start time of an adolescent's school can have a significant impact on their academic performance. On your own, and whip around. All right, that answer is true, absolutely. And there you have all the questions and all the answers up there if you didn't hear anything. But absolutely, the start time plays big, a big role into how kids do in school. And what you'll see as we go through all of our content today is that there are a lot of rules, a lot of rules that we adults have made that don't work for children and adolescents. We put systems and programs and rules in place that we think are really helping children and adolescents, but they're actually violating the way the brain works. They are violating brain rules. All right, let's think about just a few examples of that. Let's think about high school. Now I know in Baltimore, where I live and I work, average high school might start at 7.15, 7.30 in the morning. That's typical, which means that Kids are getting up in time to get there, and they have to take a bus, get breakfast, all that. So they're probably getting up at like 5.36 if they're really close to the school. And we know that the adolescent brain needs about nine, nine and a half hours of sleep. So that means that they're going to bed around eight, right? <laughs> and so we know this, right? This is not something new. We've known this for a while. And we know how much sleep an adolescent brain needs, yet, we still start their school day before their younger siblings, who go to bed way earlier than them, before most of us, unless we work in a school system. But they are going to bed last, right? Physically, their bodies don't even get tired until around 11 p.m. But we start their day before we start adult or children's days. And so when we think about these brain rules that we are violating, Sometimes it makes, us, me, makes me wonder, are we setting kids up to fail? Are we putting programs in place that work for the adult brain, but not for the kid brain? We know that the brain tests best if it's in the same environment that it learned the content. Example, think about high school kids that they're preparing for the SATs, and they took an SAT prep course in their high school, and they learned the material in their high school. The best place to test them is their high school. Now, I don't know again about Carroll County or different counties that you're all from, but I know where I grew up. I didn't get tested in my high school. I had to go 20 miles away to a whole new environment. So that just added to my stress level. Again, we know this. We know this works. We know this is how the brain works best, but we violate those rules all the time. So again, you'll see how those things come up as we go through our content today. So now it's time for my favorite part of the day. Time to explore the brain. And what we are going to learn today are six brain organs. Now we have many more than six brain organs. We have over 30. 
different organs in our brain. But we are just going to focus on six. And the six brain organs are the words that are in orange on the screen. The words in blue are the function or the job of these brain organs. Now, I believe, I don't, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, I believe that the full workbook of this is available on, online. Is that correct? I don't know. It will be, because I know we sent that in. So there is a full workbook that goes along with this. Uh, we didn't bring copies for 400 people, because that would have been a lot of trees to kill. Uh, so you have a, kind of just a little one pager, but you will have access to, to much more information uh, available online to you. Um, okay. So the words in orange are the brain organs. The words in blue are the jobs or the functions. The reason that we give each brain organ a job or a function is because another thing that neuroscience has taught us is that the brain learns best when things make sense. And so the reason we call this the brain made ridiculously simple is because we want it to be very, very simple. We want you to walk out this door this afternoon, be able to go home, sit down with your children, your spouse, your neighbor, and say, hey, let me tell you all about the hippocampus. Right? Let me tell you why. It's like the mailman. Because you're going to learn a lot of stuff today. Right? And then you have your real lives, your real jobs outside of here. So you've got a lot of information going on in your brain. You may forget some of the terms that I use. But I've already made a connection for you. I've already made that connection that the hippocampus is the mailman of your brain. And so that's the reason we give each, job, each brain organ a job, is to help you to make those connections. That being said, let's start with our hippocampus. Now our hippocampus is deep within our brain, right? It's not on the top or the bottom, it's in the middle. And our hippocampus is shaped like a seahorse. And for any of you who may speak Greek, it comes from the Greek word for seahorse because it looks like a seahorse. So these scientists that named these brain organs centuries ago weren't trying to make them complicated. They were trying to make them simple, but we just all don't speak the same language. So hippocampus, seahorse, deep within our brain. And the hippocampus is like the male carrier, to be politically correct. I happen to have a male man. So it's like the male man, the male carrier of your brain. And here's why. Think about what your male carrier does six days a week. Right? They walk around. Now, I live in a city, so they walk house to house. You live in a more rural area, they drive. But where, however they're going around, they're dropping off letters and packages to each house. And they have to be very careful to read what it is, make sure it's going to the right place. They also pick up your mail and send it to Grandma and Aunt Betty and your best friend Linda in New York. And so it's both delivering and receiving and sending. And it, your mail carrier does that with your mail. Now here's how that relates to the hippocampus. The hippocampus does the same exact thing with your memories. So the hippocampus is the memory maker of your brain. Each time you experience anything in life, anytime you learn anything new, you are making a memory. All learning is making a memory. And when you take in new information, the hippocampus takes that new information and it sends it to where it's going to be stored in your brain. Now your hippocampus does not have memories in it. They don't hang out in your hippocampus. They are sent to all different parts of your brain. And when you need them, it goes and gets them and retrieves them. Just like your mailman goes and retrieves your mail and sends it where it needs to go, your hippocampus sends your memories to where they need to go, and it goes and gets them when you need to use them. Let me prove it to you. I'm going to ask you three questions. For these questions, please don't answer out loud. Just think about the answers to yourselves. We're going to see if your hippocampus is working this morning. First question, what did you have for dinner last night? Hopefully, most of you can recall that information. That's what we call a short-term memory. It just happened maybe 15, 16 hours ago. And so most of us can find that memory pretty easily when, we, when we're asked. But now, let's think a little bit further about your dinner last night. Can you recall what it smelled like? Tasted like? Looked like? Maybe it was a taco or a cheeseburger and you ate it with your hands and you know what it felt like. Maybe you remember the person you ate with and the conversation you had. 
Now these are all different memories of the same event. If you could find all of those different pieces of information, your hippocampus is working very well because it went to the all different regions. It went to the occipital lobe to remember what it looked like. It went to the olfactory bulb to remember what it smelled like. So all different memories all found by your hippocampus. So one of the functions is short-term memories. Second question, again, just think to, the, think to yourselves about this question. Second question, what did you have for dinner on January 28th? Your laughter makes me think that you have no idea. And that's wonderful, because who cares? <laughs> Not significant for most of you. Probably about 90 to 98% of you have absolutely no idea, because who cares? Another important function of our hippocampus is to forget things. Our hippocampus forgets things every day. Some statistics say that we forget about 90 to 93% of what we experience every day. Think about it, just coming here this morning, do you remember every car you drove by? Every song that was on the radio? We forget most of what we experience. And so what you had for dinner on January 28th is probably very insignificant, and therefore you forgot. Anybody, just by a show of hands, actually know what they had on January 28th? OK, a couple of you. Is it your birthday, your child's birthday, your anniversary? Yeah, it's my birthday. I know what I had. So if that is an emotionally significant day for you, that's a whole different story. And that brings us to the next brain organ that we'll get to. If it's an emotional memory, that involves your amygdala. So we'll hold that thought, but emotional memories are different. If that day is not important, we forget it, who cares? If our hippocampus held every single thing we experienced every day, we'd be very overwhelmed. And so very important to know that our hippocampus forgets things all the time. The hippocampus is the primary organ of the brain involved in Alzheimer's. Makes sense, right? It's the memory maker of our brain. When someone develops Alzheimer's, their hippocampus starts to calcify, and it stops working, making it very hard to retrieve memories for some people or create new memories. So it makes sense. Memory maker impacted by Alzheimer's. OK, third question about the hippocampus. Don't answer out loud, please. Third question, when is your mother's birthday? Most of you, when I ask that question, can automatically pull up that information. It's something you've been thinking about since you were a small boy or girl. And even if your mother is no longer with us, you probably still think about it every year when that date comes. Now, unless it's today or tomorrow, you probably weren't thinking about it before I asked. But when I, as soon as I ask that question, you can find it. That means your hippocampus is working. It's finding what we call a long-term memory. So short-term memories and long-term memories are both controlled by our hippocampus. Now, let's think about kids, young people that are in school. Whether they are in elementary, middle, high school, or college, the hippocampus is critical for academic success. If we want young people to be successful in school, they have to, A, learn new things every day. Every day when they go into school, they have to learn new things which are start off as short-term memories and they have to build upon what they already know. Right? You don't walk into eighth grade and learn the alphabet and learn what two plus two is because you have to have that memory already stored in your brain. And your hippocampus needs to be able to retrieve that when you need it. Big, big star next to this one, very, very important to know. The hippocampus is the primary organ of the brain impacted by stress. So when anybody, doesn't matter how old or young you are, when we have what we call chronic stress, highly elevated levels of stress over time, that's what chronic means, highly elevated stress over periods of time, that stress, which is called cortisol, goes directly to your hippocampus. And it actually eats away neurons, kills neurons in your hippocampus. Think of like little Pac-Man going in there and eating the cells, the neurons of your hippocampus, making it physically smaller in size. If your hippocampus is smaller in size, memory making is going to become harder. School is going to become harder. Remembering appointments, remembering phone numbers, remember to take your medication in the morning, remembering to pick your kid up from daycare. 
all of those things are going to become more challenging for individuals who experience chronic stress. Good news, hopefully many of you are thinking, oh my goodness, can it get better? Absolutely. Absolutely it can get better. It gets better through a process called neurogenesis. Neurogenesis is the birth of new brain cells. And so we can have neurogenesis happen throughout the entire lifespan. There has been neurogenesis identified in people in over the age of 100, but it's really hard to have neurogenesis happen at that age. Those individuals have to take very, very good care of themselves. They have to eat healthy, they have to exercise, they have to be learning new things. Not live in that couch potato lifestyle. Neurogenesis will not happen at that age if you're not doing those things to take care of yourselves. But the more we can lower our stress and take good care of ourselves, the better chance we have of recovering from that chronic stress damage to our hippocampus. The hippocampus develops between the ages of two and three. So somewhere between our second and third birthday, it finishes developing. What that means is that if you have a friend who said to you, I remember my first birthday party. I had a pink dress and I got a Barbie doll. No. You don't remember your first birthday party. You can't remember your first birthday party. You saw a picture. Your sister told you about it. But we don't have the ability to have those detailed memories prior to the age of two sometimes three. What you can have is an emotional memory. And that brings us to our second brain organ. There you can see where the hippocampus is. So it's lighting up there. We have two of them. But that brings us to our amygdala. And the amygdala is the emotional center of our brain. So the hippocampus is the memory maker. And it's like the mailman. And the amygdala is the emotional center of our brain and we like to call our amygdala the palace guard. And here's why. Think about what a palace guard does. His or her job is to protect everyone inside the palace. And that's what your amygdala's job is. Its job is to protect you. To constantly be on the lookout for anything potentially dangerous. Doesn't mean it is actually dangerous, but potentially dangerous. And then its job is to react quickly. Its job is not to stop and think and weigh out the pros and cons. Its job is to react quickly. So let's take for an example. Let's imagine someone just came bursting through one of these doors behind me. They had a mask on their face and a rifle in their hand, and they came bursting into this auditorium. What would you do? Hopefully, you'd do something. Right? Some of you said, I'm going to run. Right? We call that flight. So I'm going to run as quickly as I can out of the room. I see some big guys in the audience. And you're thinking, I'm not going to run. I'm going to tackle him. All right, I'm going to get him down on the ground. I'm going to save the day. We call that fight. And some of you are going to panic and freeze. And you're not going to be able to do anything. And that's also a normal reaction. But that's still a reaction. What you don't want to happen is to say to the masked man with the rifle, hey, what's up, there's a seat over here, come on in. Yeah, we're learning about the brain, it's good stuff, come on in. That probably is not going to save your life. So if you don't react to dangerous situations, that means your amygdala is not working very well. But for most of us, when we are perceiving that we're in danger, we do something about it, fight, flight, or freeze. So that's our amygdala's job, to protect us, and it's always, always 100% of the time on that lookout for anything dangerous. Our amygdala is up and running the day we are born. The day you are born, your amygdala works. And it creates our emotional memory. So it doesn't remember what 2 plus 2 is, doesn't remember the capital of Maryland, but it remembers how things make us feel. It does not remember neutral things. It remembers extremes. So. Think about the most wonderful, joyful days of your life. A day or an event that brought you pure joy, your amygdala remembers how that made you feel. And there's a reason for that. Because it says, hey, that was really wonderful. Do things like that again. 
All right, to the ladies in the audience, just by a quick show of hands, how many of you have given birth to more than one child? Because it felt so good. <laughs> Some of you are going, yeah, most of you probably wouldn't use those words to describe childbirth, but the emotional reward was so amazing that you did it again. You loved your child so much, and hopefully still love them, you love your child so much that you chose to go through childbirth again. When things bring us pure joy, our brain says, yeah, I really like that kind of stuff. I love vacations. When you fall in love with someone and you think about them all the time and you just want to see them every day and talk to them every day, it's because your amygdala says, I just feel so good. I just want to get more and more of this. I love the way that makes me feel. Now, you can imagine what's coming next. The same is true for terrible experiences. When we experience trauma, when we experience a traumatic event, our amygdala also remembers how that makes us feel. And there's a reason for it. There's a purpose to that. The purpose is to tell us to avoid things like that again. Right? You can think about your own life, and I'll give you a few quick examples. I was in a car accident about eight or nine years ago. I wasn't hurt, I was very fortunate, but it was very, very traumatic. Car flipped over, spun around on the roof, really scary. And the accident happened about three blocks from my house. And so a few days later, I'm going to work, I'm driving home, and I get to the intersection where the accident happened. I need to make a left-hand turn because my house is just three blocks up the road, and I freeze. Freeze, can't make a left-hand turn. At the time, I had no idea why. I went way out of my way to the next light, made a right-hand turn all the way around. Now, I know exactly what was happening. That was my amygdala protecting me. That was my amygdala saying, duh, don't you remember what happened here Saturday night? We're not making a left-hand turn here. Uh, hello, go to the light. So when things like that happen and you're going, why won't I go over there? Why, won't I ha why, does why do I have this crazy fear of dogs? Oh, when I was three, I was bit. Yeah, now I know why because my amygdala is protecting me. So it can be simple things that make very clear sense, like being in an accident, getting bit by a dog. It can also be a little harder to explain. There was a young girl in our foster care program. She was four years old. <clears throat> she was placed in foster care because she had been abused in her biological family. And she was in a lovely foster home, two-parent home, foster mom and foster dad. She'd been there for about a month and things were going really well. They had a lovely routine. They had dinner together each evening. Then they had a bath, then story time, and then bedtime. And it was typically the foster mom who did bath time, story time, and bedtime. Dad would you know, do something, clean up from dinner. But one night, mom had plans. And so foster dad said, no problem. I will take over. You go and do what you need to do. And so they had dinner together. Mom puts her in the bath, then she leaves. A few minutes later, dad walks into the bathroom to help the little girl wash up and get ready for bed. He walks into the bathroom, and the little girl flips out, screaming, runs out of the bathtub naked past him, knocks everything off the counter. She runs to the front yard, still screaming. Neighbors come, police are called. It was a truly traumatic event for the little girl and for the father. Now this poor man is just devastated, wondering what he did wrong. Well, he didn't do anything wrong. Her amygdala was doing its job. This little girl had been sexually abused in the bathtub by her father. And so her amygdala said, uh-uh, man, bathroom, bath time, I'm naked. I'm not letting this happen again. I'm going to do everything in my little four-year-old power to avoid this and get out of this situation. I'm not thinking about the consequences. Right? Remember, it doesn't stop and think. It reacts quickly. And she did exactly what her brain needed to do to protect herself. And so often when we work with young people, we'll see these triggers and we're going, why are they doing that? And sometimes it's just their amygdala protecting them, avoiding those situations that caused them trauma. And remember, it's developed at birth, which means before we have language, we can have memories. If any of you are in the counseling therapy field, you know that you may work with children or adults who have these memories that they can't explain because they don't have words for them. They may have had traumatic events happen in the first year or two of their life before their hippocampus was developed, so they can't tell you about it before they have language, 
but they're still truly real memories. And their amygdala is going to try its best to avoid those situations. So as I mentioned, the amygdala doesn't stop and think. And children and adolescents are ruled by their amygdalas. During childhood and adolescence, the amygdala is the part of the brain that is ruling our decision making. And so this is often the part of the brain that leads adults to ask of children, what were you thinking? And now you know, they weren't. They weren't thinking. Their brains are not designed to stop and think the way that ours are. Now as they get to be older teens in their young 20s, hopefully they're really starting to stop and think, but little kids aren't very good at this. And so that's explained by the fact that they are ruled by their amygdalas. Now I told you the hippocampus gets smaller with stress. What do you think happens to the amygdala? It gets bigger. It gets bigger and more active when we're in stress. When we have that high level of stress, our amygdala is more active and we often have a very hard time stopping and thinking. We make very impulsive decisions. Think about your own life. Last time you felt really, really stressed. Did you ever make an impulsive decision? Did you ever send that email you wish you could get back? <laughs> Leave that voicemail that you wish you could sneak into the apartment and delete? Because we make emotional decisions, not thoughtful, logical decisions. All right, next organ of the brain, the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus <clears throat> is the what's in it for me organ. W-I-I-F-M stands for what's in it for me. This is the organ of the brain that we call the relevance organ. Now the hypothalamus does some other important things. It controls our body temperature. So when we're hot, it's what tells us to sweat. When we're cold, it tells us to shiver. When we're thirsty, it tells us to drink. So, excuse me, it does some very important things like that. But in addition, it's also the relevance organ. Any of you live with fourth graders? Okay, you are the experts. Or teach fourth graders or live with fourth graders. Either one, just a handful. Those of you that know fourth graders, you are the experts on the hypothalamus. Because sometime in fourth grade, between the ages of nine and 10, the hypothalamus kicks in and starts asking, what's in it for me? Prior to that age, when adults give children directions, they may stomp and huff and puff, but they traditionally will comply eventually. But after the hypothalamus kicks in, it's a whole different story. Because they want to know why. Why do I have to eat vegetables? Why do I have to wear a raincoat out? Why do I have to go to bed at 9 o'clock? What's the point? What's in it for me? And this organ of our brain stays active from the age of 9 for the rest of our lives. So it doesn't go away after 9. And it's active in every single one of you. I know a lot of you work in school systems, right? School's done. But you got up even earlier than you're used to getting up today, and you came here this morning. And I bet when your alarm went off, your hypothalamus said, what? Why am I doing this? I could be home relaxing today, gardening, playing with my kids. What's in it for me? Oh, I'm going to learn some important information. Oh, my boss told me I have to go. Oh, I already paid those $30. I better show up. Whatever your answer is, your hypothalamus wants to know why. And so when we are working with young people, remember that after the age of nine, this organ of the brain is active and they want to know why. What's the point? Why in the world do I have to take algebra? My mom owns a hair salon down the street that I already know I'm gonna work at. Why do I have to learn algebra? What's in it for me? And when kids can't answer these questions and we can't help them answer it, there's much less investment in learning. Now, for some young people, the motivation may be, well, I just want to graduate high school, and I have to take algebra to graduate high school, and that's enough. But that's not enough for all kids. And if we can't make that relevant piece for them, we're going to have a lot less of an investment in learning. And that's normal, and it's healthy to want to know why. What's the point? What's in it for me? All right, the fourth organ of the brain, sorry, is the corpus callosum. And the corpus callosum is the bridge in our brain. It runs right down the middle of our brain, and it connects our left and right hemispheres. 
Most communication between our hemispheres happens in our corpus callosum. And interestingly, the corpus callosum is the biggest difference between the male and female brain. It is approximately 20% larger in most females than it is in most males. Why does this matter? Well, here's what it does. It's like the bridge and it connects the hemispheres, which means it's the part of our brain that allows us to toggle, to toggle between left and right hemisphere activities and functions. Many people say multitask. Neuroscientists don't like the word multitask. They like the word toggle, to go back and forth between different thoughts, different ideas, different actions. And it's the corpus callosum that allows us to do that. 20% larger in females, which means females in general have a much easier time toggling, going back and forth between different thoughts, different ideas, different activities. Males, on the other hand, have a much easier time starting a task and finishing it. Take, for example, an Orioles game. All right, especially those ones that go into extra innings. Many men can sit and watch that entire Orioles game from start to finish without doing anything else except maybe using the bathroom. Now females during that same Orioles game are going to think, well, I might as well throw a load of laundry on while the game is on and why not put dinner in the oven? Oh, I'm just going to call my sister real quick. I'll be right back down. I can't sit here and watch three and a half hours of a game. You know how many other things I could get done? I gotta toggle back and forth. So that's the corpus callosum. That explains some of the differences in that male and female brain. So here you can see some of the functions of our left and right hemisphere, and it's critical that we're able to toggle back and forth because different things occur in each hemisphere, and so we need the ability to go back and forth between our left and our right hemispheres. When we have chronic stress, the corpus callosum also gets smaller which makes toggling, multitasking, transitioning from activity to activity, think transitioning from lunch to chemistry during the school day can be really hard. If that corpus callosum is smaller, that's gonna be even more challenging. All right, that brings us to our second to last brain organ. Our second to last brain organ is specifically second to last because it's the second to last organ to develop in the brain and that is our cerebellum. And I'll show you where it is. If you take your hands and put them on your neck behind you, yep, like this, I'm gonna turn around so you can see what I'm doing, but you're gonna take your hands and just slide up. All right. And where you can start to feel your skull come out a little bit, underneath your hair and your skin and your skull, that's your cerebellum. It's in the back of your brain, feels good to massage it a little. And your cerebellum comes from the Latin word for little brain, because if you look at the picture, it looks a little bit like a little brain. And the cerebellum is the mover and the shaker of your brain. It's the organ of your brain that controls movement, coordination, and balance. So if your cerebellum doesn't work very well, you're going to have a hard time with those functions. So many people that may have traumatic brain injuries, and if they fall backwards, they fall, say, off a bike or a motorcycle, and they hit the back of their heads, are often going to have issues with movement and coordination. If someone hits the front of their head, that's their frontal lobe, we'll get to that next. But brain injuries that occur in different parts of the brain will certainly impact us differently. But without a functioning cerebellum, you will have a very hard time with movement, coordination, and balance. And not just gross motor movement like walking and jumping and skipping, but also fine motor movement as well. Things like picking up your pencil, brushing your teeth, typing on a computer. So all of those functions are controlled by our cerebellum. The cerebellum typically develops around 12 or 13. Now it's there from birth, they're all there from birth, but they are a work in progress until about the age of 12 or 13 for this brain organ. Now, important key thing, star it, highlight it, to know about the cerebellum. It will only develop on time if we move which means for young people who don't have very much movement, play, exercise, their cerebellums are gonna develop later. So for kids that we may call those couch potatoes, kids that sit on the bus, sit in school, come home, play video games, and then go to bed, their cerebellum is going to be delayed. So instead of 12 or 13, it might be 15, 16, 17. 
that might not sound like a huge deal. Here's where the huge deal comes in. It's the second to last part to develop. And not until the cerebellum is done does it send the message to our frontal lobe to finish. So our cerebellum's done at 12 or 13, tells our frontal lobe to go ahead and finish. So our frontal lobe should be done around 24 or 25. That's typical. If our cerebellum isn't done till 16 or 17, our frontal lobes are not going to be done till closer to 30. And there's a big deal. That's where the big deal comes in. So exercise, movement, and play for young people is not only important for a physically healthy body, but for a brain that can develop on time, develop in a typical manner. So that brings us to our last brain organ. And I'll go through the last brain organ, then we'll take our break. So our last brain organ are our frontal lobes. Our frontal lobes are the largest lobe of our brain. They are right behind our foreheads. And our frontal lobes do some very important things. Our frontal lobe is also known as the executive function system. And our frontal lobes control some things like impulse control, knowing right from wrong, judgment, time orientation, all those very important grown-up skills that we want our adolescents to be getting better at, better at are controlled by our frontal lobes. Now, our frontal lobes are there when we're born, but they are very immature. And as we get older and older, they get stronger and stronger. But they are a work in progress until we are in our mid-20s. And that's for typical healthy development. If all is going well, they will be done in your early to mid-20s. When things are not going well, they're going to be even later, which means that all of the young people that you work with, even if they're in college, are still a work in progress. They still need us to help them with these functions. And that's why we compare it to learning how to drive. If you have ever had the pleasure of teaching an adolescent how to drive, or if someone taught you when you were an adolescent, think about how hard that was how many different things we need to do at one time in order to drive well. Now, driving is easy. Driving well is really where the problem comes in. And adolescents typically don't drive very well because they have to use impulse control and judgment all at the same time. Now, the frontal lobes develop around the age of 25. We discovered this. Well, I had nothing to do with it. I shouldn't say we. Jay Geed and his team of neuroscientists discovered this in 1991. That is 22 years ago, 22 years ago, they discovered that the frontal lobes don't develop until 25. Prior to that, we used to think it was 16. And so we tacked on two years for good luck, and we said at 18, you are an adult. Go out into the world, you can vote, you can go to war, you can sign a legal contract, you can get married, you can do all these very, very important things, and if you mess up, you will be held responsible as though you are an adult. Now, for 22 years, we have known that the brain is not done developing until our mid-20s. Yet we have changed no laws. We still allow 16-year-olds to drive. We still hold 18-year-olds responsible for their behaviors as though they are fully functioning adults. And it just makes me wonder, is that fair? when we know what's going on in the brain. Are 18-year-olds truly responsible enough to be held accountable for their actions as though they're adults? Now, neuroscientists discovered this 22 years ago, but other people knew it well before that. How old do you have to be to rent a car? 25, huh? How old are you, especially if you're a male, when your car insurance rates drop? Huh, 25, interesting. We didn't need neuroscience, just look at who is driving well and who is driving safely. After we reach our mid-20s, we become much safer drivers, which is why they allow us to rent cars and they drop our rates because we make better decisions. The frontal lobes develop one to three years faster in females than they do in males. Another significant difference in the brain, especially for school-age children, because little girls are often better at these functions than little boys are. That has nothing to do with intelligence. It strictly has to do with brain development. So things like sitting still, waiting your turn, raising your hand before speaking, are typically a little bit easier for girls than they are for boys. 
If you look at the statistics of who's getting suspended and expelled from school, it's somewhere between three to five times more boys in the United States get suspended and expelled than girls do. So again, makes you just ponder and think about, are we punishing boys for being boys? That's a whole different workshop though. <laughs> All right, that's a lot of brain science. Let's take a break. I will see you back in 15 minutes. Well, we ended, we ended before the break talking about the frontal lobes. A few fantastic questions were brought to my attention during the break that I'd like to answer for the whole group because I think they're things I forgot to mention. And so just a few additional pieces about the frontal lobe is that the frontal lobes are where ADHD occurs. So for individuals who are diagnosed with ADHD, ADHD is a disorder of the frontal lobes, which when you look at the functions of the frontal lobe makes sense. Individuals who have ADHD struggle with time orientation, focus, paying attention, learning from their mistakes, predicting consequences, all of those things can also be symptoms of ADHD. So it makes sense that this is the organ of the brain primarily impacted by ADHD. Another question came up about the term executive function disorder. Again, it makes sense. These are called executive functions. So executive function disorder, which is a new diagnosis, uh, it also is a disorder of the frontal lobes. It's not meeting the criteria for ADHD, but it's still for individuals who are struggling with these executive functions that are listed up here. And that's just a partial list. There are a few others. But one of the ones that you may notice up there is time orientation. And I always think this is an important one to share with parents of adolescents and anyone really who works with teenagers or adolescents, because how often do we say to young people, meet me outside in 15 minutes, I'll be in the car. And then we are sitting outside going, I am going to kill them. Where are they? As adults, most of us can estimate what 15 minutes is. But some of us may struggle in that area. Some of us may have a hard time estimating what a certain amount of time is. You may have ADHD, but you may not. You may just not be that strong in that certain executive function, and that's normal. We all have strengths and weaknesses when it comes to our executive functions. But I encourage you that when you are working with young people or raising young people, that you keep that in mind. They don't estimate time very well. So if you have an elementary schooler at home and you say you've got 20 minutes to play your video games, then get in the bath and go to bed and you just wait for it to happen, mm-mm, mm-mm-mm. We need to give them tools. And so sometimes we give them tools like cell phones or watches, or some of you sitting up really close, you saw my handy little tool here. This is called a time timer. If you've never seen one before, and if you are a classroom teacher especially, this is a priceless tool. Here's how it works. You set an amount of time. So say, for example, you want to give your students 25 minutes to read a book and write an essay on it. You set the timer for 25 minutes, and then it just goes away. Ah. And when it's gone, it beeps. So you don't have to remind them of how much time. It's a visual cue. You know, think about at home, you give your son five minutes of a timeout, right? And when five minutes is up, it goes away. Now, it is not magic. Kids can move it if you leave it close enough to them. But it's a great visual cue. Now I have to recheck my time. OK, we have, mm, all right. So I set it for me. And for me, as a presenter, if you're a presenter, or you're someone that gives up and talks to people in large audiences and you don't want to constantly be trying to figure out the time, it's a great tool for a lot of different reasons. And it's called a time timer. But what we have to do as the adults who are helping young people is be their surrogate frontal lobes. Because we know their frontal lobes don't work all that well yet, so we have to help them. Just like when we teach someone to drive, we have to help them. They practice over and over and over again we, as the adults in children's lives, have to help them to use their frontal lobes. So if you want big biceps and triceps, you go to the gym, you work out, you lift weights, and they get bigger. You want a stronger frontal lobe, you have to use it. And we have to help kids to practice these functions so they get better at them. OK, that's the end of anatomy. There's only one slide on chemistry. And then we're done. So here's 
what we're going to do with chemistry. We have many neurotransmitters, way more than four, but we're only going to focus on these four right now. And these will tie in to everything else that we talk about in our time together today. So let's start up on top. We have cortisol. You've heard me mention cortisol several times. Cortisol is our uh-oh chemical, our uh-oh chemical, our stress chemical, our stress neurotransmitter. We all have it. We all need it. What we don't want to have is too much of it. Low levels of cortisol is what we're aiming for. Now, if something happens and we need to be able to react quickly, like that person busting through that door with the gun, cortisol levels are going to go up. Your cortisol levels change throughout the day. If you're calm and relaxed right now, you probably have a very low level of cortisol. If you look at your phone and someone texts you and says, you have to get home right away, your pipes have burst and your basement is flooding, whoop, cortisol is going to go up again. So levels can change all the time. In general, though, you want to keep cortisol low. A little bit of stress here and there, ups are totally normal. Stress is normal. The problem arises when we have chronic levels of cortisol. High levels over long periods of time is when we have those brain changes that I talked about earlier today. The extreme of cortisol is adrenaline, right? And for those of you that are athletes or coaches, you know about adrenaline, right? Adrenaline is awesome on the football field. Adrenaline's awesome on the track. When you're running that 400 meter race, it's great, it allows you to perform at amazing abilities. Adrenaline is not great in math or science, <laughs> or language arts. Imagine that feeling of performing, right? It's not just sports. You may be a musician, an actor, an actress, you may be a preacher. When you get up and you're about to perform, adrenaline allows you to perform. But we don't want to have high levels of adrenaline, because think about what that feels like. It doesn't feel good for learning. Adrenaline is there. It's our yikes chemical. Right, we hear about moms who lift cars to get their babies underneath them. Right, that's adrenaline. It's there when we need it, but we want to keep it very low. The best way to keep those two chemicals low is to up the bottom ones, serotonin and dopamine. Do you see the little scale picture on the side? And that's a visual to help you remember. As one goes up, the other goes down. As we get a lot of cortisol and adrenaline, that means our serotonin and dopamine are going to be low. But as we increase serotonin and dopamine, cortisol and adrenaline go down. So serotonin is our ah, it's our serenity chemical. It's our chemical of serenity, calmness, what makes us feel good and comfortable and nurtured. We want to bathe our brains in serotonin all day long. And the good news is that you can. There are things that you can do all day that are free and easy that will increase your serotonin. Increased levels of serotonin prime the brain for learning. When we have high levels of serotonin, we are focused, we feel good, we feel safe, and we're ready to learn. There are lots of ways to get serotonin. A few that are pretty easy. Sunshine. All right, it's free. Go outside on a sunny day. You're going to get some serotonin. Exercise. Now, you go out and run a 10-mile race, you're going to get dopamine. So that's a whole different category. But you go out for a jog, a walk, you walk your dog this evening, you go play a little light game of tennis, exercise is going to give us serotonin. Food. Ever have a bad day, you go home and you're just like, mm, I just want to make mom's mac and cheese. I want to make a pot roast because I want that comfort food. Comfort food gives us serotonin. Friendships. Right? Many of you came in this morning, you may have run into old friends, colleagues you haven't seen in a while. Oh, Mary, it's so good to see you. And you give that little one-armed hug. Right? That's serotonin. It makes us feel good. Volunteer work, helping other people, giving back, service learning, gives us serotonin. So there are many, many things that we can do that don't cost money that will increase our serotonin. Now, if those things aren't enough, which is the case for many people, a lack of serotonin equals depression. When you don't have enough serotonin, you have depression. And if those activities that I mentioned aren't enough to change your brain chemistry, you may need medication. Many people take what we call SSRIs, Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitors, better known as Prozac and Zoloft 
and medications in that family. And what those medications are doing is they're allowing your brain to absorb more serotonin, giving you more of that ah, calm, safe, nurtured, serene feeling, and less of the cortisol. So very common for individuals to have depression, which is a lack of serotonin, and anxiety, which is too much cortisol. They often go hand in hand. And as you treat one, you treat the other. So as you feel less depressed, you also often feel less anxious and stressed. So that's our serotonin. And then the extreme of serotonin is dopamine. We're gonna talk a lot about dopamine this afternoon when we talk about addictions. But dopamine is our Yahoo chemical. Right? It feels really good. When things give us dopamine, we wanna do them again. That's the way the human brain is designed. When things give us pleasure, we try to repeat them. We try to avoid pain and seek out pleasure. So pleasure is about dopamine. Now dopamine's not quite as easy to get as serotonin is, but when we get it, we really like it. It feels really, really good. So a few ways that we know to get dopamine, as I mentioned already, the extreme exercise, right? So you ever have somebody that says they have a runner's high, or they go out and they run, they come back and they're in the best mood? Because a ton of that, you know, that extreme exercise is gonna give you an increase in dopamine. Love, right? Friendship is serotonin, but love is dopamine. For those of you who are in love with someone, or those of you that have a child at home that you love, or a grandchild, when you see that person, you feel good. You get dopamine, even just from seeing that person. So love is about dopamine. Chocolate is about dopamine. <laughs> True, truly. We'll talk more about that this afternoon, but chocolate also increases your dopamine. Music, slow music will increase serotonin. Fast music can increase dopamine. So there are many ways that we can increase our dopamine, but it's the things that we do that make us feel that yahoo good. All right, now let's talk about adolescence. Adolescents that we're, that we're learning about this morning have some issues with their brain chemistry. For females, for adolescent females, their serotonin levels naturally decrease, naturally, which puts them at risk for depression. So adolescent girls are more vulnerable to depression than girls of other ages or boys. For boys, they naturally have a drop in dopamine, which means that adolescent boys are craving dopamine. So this is a question just for the males in the audience, just for the men. So gentlemen, just by a quick show of hands, how many of you engaged in some sort of activity during your adolescent years that you're lucky to be alive for today? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very common. Very common for adolescent males to engage in risky behavior because they're craving dopamine. And so they're going to engage in behaviors that are going to give them dopamine. Sometimes it's very healthy behaviors like playing in a band, playing on a sports team. You're going to get dopamine. But sometimes it may be car surfing. Right? It may be jumping out the second floor window trying to land in the pool. Or it may be drugs and alcohol because drugs and alcohol also give us dopamine. Crack, cocaine, methamphetamines, nicotine, and alcohol all increase dopamine in ways that our brains are not intended to handle it. I'm gonna save going too far into that until this afternoon when we talk specifically about addictions and the brain. But just remember that connection, drugs and alcohol are about dopamine, that Yahoo chemical, that pleasure chemical. And when something feels good, we want to repeat it. Okay, now let's focus more on the adolescent brain. Some of you are sitting kind of far away, so I'm gonna read this next slide to you. I don't usually like to read to my audience, but the words might be a little small. So I want you to listen to this saying, and I want you to try to guess who do you think said it and about when. So I'll read it, then I'll give you a few seconds to talk with your table mates, try to guess who said it and when. Our youth now love luxury. They have bad manners, contempt for authority. They show disrespect for their elders and love chatter in the place of exercise. 
They no longer rise when elders enter the room. They contradict their parents, chatter before company, gobble up their food, and tyrannize their teachers. All right, turn to your tail news. Who do you think said it and when? 20 seconds. When I do this in smaller groups and I can interact a little bit more, the most common answer I get is Bill Cosby in the 80s. It was Socrates. We had a few people know, say Socrates. And the reason I show you this quote is because people are still saying the same exact thing. We might have a little bit different terminology. We don't use the word elders nearly as much anymore. But the same issues that were happening in the 5th century BC are happening today. The issues with adolescents are not new. Now they're different, they're different. There are some things that are new now, but the overall, the general idea is exactly the same. There's nothing new with this whole idea that adolescents are difficult. It is a challenging time of development. And when we understand that it's supposed to be challenging, it takes a little bit of pressure off of us. So this has all been going on for quite some time. You are not the first person to have a difficult adolescent on your caseload, in your school, or in your home. There are many people who feel very, very similar to you. If you want to leave here today and continue learning more about the adolescent brain, I would highly recommend this book. It's a paperback book. You could probably get it on Amazon for just a few dollars because it's a few years old now. It is very, very user-friendly and easy to read. Um, and it's just, it's written by a psychologist who's also a parent of adolescents. So it's not only from the neuroscience perspective, but also from a parent perspective. It's very easy to read and very useful. So if you want to learn more, there's my recommendation. So when we think about what adolescence is, adolescence is not childhood. It's not adulthood, it's that time in between, and it's getting longer. It's getting longer because puberty is starting earlier. It is starting earlier than it did a decade ago, and considerably earlier than it did a century ago. This workshop, this specific workshop, Giving a Fish a Bath, used to only be marketed to high schools, because that's what we thought it should go. And then we started getting calls from middle schools, and that made sense, and then I started getting calls for elementary schools. And I realized that for people who teach fifth graders, it is not uncommon to have children in your classrooms who have hit puberty and are dealing with issues of adolescence in elementary schools. So the onset of puberty is getting earlier and earlier. And we know that the frontal lobes now, we know they're not really done developing until 25. And sometimes people are even later than that. So that period of adolescence can last from, say, 9 or 10 all the way to our mid-20s, that adolescent mindset of thinking. So what do you think? I'll give you about two minutes to talk with your neighbors. In your experience, whatever your experience may be, what do you think is the most challenging aspect of being a teenager today in our time? So two minutes, talk with your neighbors, most challenging thing about being a teenager. OK, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Let's take a look at what we know are some of the adolescent challenges, right? Adolescents today have to figure out what's going on with their bodies. They have to deal with the chemical changes that we talked about. They have mood changes. They have social issues. They have to decide, are they going to follow in their parents' footsteps? Are they going to be the same religion as their parents? Are they going to have sex or are they not going to have sex? Are they going to try drinking or are they not going to try drinking? Which social group are they going to be a part of? There's a lot of social pressure along with the physical changes and the neurological changes that are going on. And so again, this unique time of development can make it very challenging, not only for the young people, but for the adults who are caring for them and trying to help them. 
very hard to talk about adolescence today and not bring up the idea of technology. Because although we heard Socrates' quote from the 5th century BC, what they didn't have then was Facebook. And so today we do have some new challenges. The idea of technology is still fairly new. I did not grow up with a computer in my house, and I'm not that old. So it's still pretty new, this idea of being socially connected 24-7. So just some things to think about. What's so different today? Are the brains of adolescents today hardwired differently? Many neuroscientists say yes, they are, because they've never known a world where they're not connected. They've never known a world without instant contact to other people. They're not very good at waiting. I know that's a shock to many of you. But do you remember the art of dropping off film? <laughs> remember? And then going back like three days later to pick it up? <gasps> and hoping, hoping that you got three or four good pictures. <laughs> Ask a teenager, they're gonna go, what? Two and three year olds know that they can look at the picture on the back of the camera or the phone. Oh, that's not a good one, go to the next one. There's no such thing as bad pictures anymore. We don't have film anymore. So these are little things that people who are adolescents now have never had to deal with. Waiting to get your letter in the mail? Having pen pals? I loved having pen pals. <laughs> now you can still have that idea, but it's all gonna be done via email now. And so there are certainly benefits to that. But there are some side effects as well. The idea of reading a book slowly, of teaching from a textbook, kids wanna be connected. They want that instant gratification. I know when I was in elementary school, the whole class would have to do well and wait till the last Friday of the month to have a pizza party. We didn't get anything in between. No stickers, no pencils, none of that. We just waited. And we could wait for that long amount of time. Young people today often have a hard time waiting because they are so used to that instant gratification. And so brains are different. And then, again, we won't have time to really discuss this, but I encourage you to bring this conversation to your colleagues and friends. Is working with adolescents today harder or easier than it was a few decades ago? And so again, just things to think about, some ideas in your head when you leave here. A few facts for you. Adolescents today have spent less than 5,000 hours of their lives reading. In 1984, this was 12,000 hours. Adolescents today have spent over 10,000 hours playing video games and over 20,000 hours watching television. I know you cannot read that study, but what's up there is to show you the connection that's being made by the amount of time that children spend watching television and some of the side effects, such as increased obesity, decreased academic performance, increased alcohol abuse, increased cigarette smoking. And so many studies being done on the connection and some of the, the negative side effects of the increase of technology. So the big question when it comes to technology is really to ask ourselves, technology is not going anywhere. We're not going to stop progressing. And so if we continue to expect adolescents to get used to the way that we do things, is that really realistic? Or do we have to catch up a little? And do we have to look at what works for them and the way that their brains are hardwired and perhaps change the way that we're doing things and change the way that we are providing information? And that can be really hard and scary, especially if you've been doing something for decades and decades a certain way, and now you have to put a smart board in your classroom. It's hard. But when we know the way that brains are developing, it's something we really need to think about. So I mentioned earlier that the adolescent brain is very unique, and here's why. What we've learned in the past few decades is that there are two vulnerable periods in brain development. One happens when we're very young, when we're zero to five, and then again when we're an adolescent. So this new paradigm, it used to just be when we're really little, it's all we knew about. And with advanced technology, we've been able to see that this occurrence happens not only when we're very young, 
but again during our adolescent years. And during those years, our brain has some very unique things happen. Some things that cause fuzzy thinking, that make us vulnerable to stress, that make us have less awareness of what's going on around us, a harder time managing our emotions. And when you ask an adolescent what's going on in their brains, and I encourage you to do that, I encourage you to ask them what's filling their brains. And it's actually an activity that I do often with young people, and I draw a big circle and I say, this is your brain. Fill it up with everything that's going on in it. And I have them write down the things that they're thinking about. And I'm often very surprised. Things that I think they're stressed about aren't there at all. And so you see just one teen's examples of things that may be going on in their brain. But the four fundamentals, there are four fundamental things that happen during this time of development. And they are blossoming, pruning, myelination, and hormones. And so just to give you a little background, not too much of a background on neurons. As human beings, we have billions, with a B, billions of neurons all throughout our brain and body. And it's through neuronal communication that we learn new things, that our body communicates within itself. You stub your toe, the neurons in your toe quickly communicate to the rest of your body. It says, ow, and it hurts. It happens at speeds we can't even explain. You touch a hot stove, you immediately move your hand away because those neurons communicated. And so our billions of neurons are communicating with each other all the time. Our bodies are filled with these neurons, those very pretty neurons. But something unique happens during adolescence. So in my very scientific model of a neuron here for you, now those of you up front can see it much better. It's made with pipe cleaners. But this is what a neuron looks like. It's a little bit smaller in our bodies, very, very much smaller in our bodies. But we have these guys hanging off up here. These are called dendrites. And it's through the dendrites in our neuron that they can communicate with each other. So the dendrites of this neuron would communicate to the terminal of the next neuron. And so for a simple model of it, so you want to go home and explain this to your friends and families, you just take your hand and do this. You can follow along. So like, like you're waving to someone. Your fingers are the dendrites. Your palm is the um, nucleus. Your arm is the axon. And your elbow is the terminal. So that's a neuron. Now your next neuron over here, it's going to communicate to your elbow. <laughs> so they don't communicate like this. A lot of people think they communicate like this. That's not how they work. They communicate like this. So this happens billions and billions of times throughout your body. All right, so that's just your kind of neurons 101. Now, during adolescence, these neurons, they, this would be what a neuron would look like before adolescence and after adolescence. And then, during that time of development, this process of blossoming happens. So those typical neurons blossom into this. All right, so this is what yours look like. This is what a 15-year-old look like. Good and bad. Pros and cons. Having all of these extra dendrites make this the prime time in life to learn new skills. This is the time in life when you want to learn how to play a new sport. This is the time in life when you want to learn how to play chess, when you want to learn how to cook, how to sew. Now, this also happens from zero to five, but we don't usually teach zero to five-year-olds how to cook and sew and play sports because they don't have the physical ability to do it. So during adolescence now is when you're going to learn soccer and football and field hockey. You're going to learn how to play the guitar, how to play the piano, because you have all of these opportunities to learn new things. And that's wonderful. However, this also causes fuzzy thinking. Because every single time an adolescent has to think about something, is asked a question, has to come up with an answer, they have to get through this mess. Right, so here, when I say to my adolescent that I'm working with, did you take the trash out before you went out last night? Well, yes, I did. Or, well, no, I didn't. Now I ask this neuron. Did you take the trash out? Well, yeah, I mean, well, yeah, kind of. <laughs> well, yeah, well, I didn't take it out before I went out, but I took it out. Sometimes we get lying behavior. Not because your children are immoral and unethical, although perhaps they may be. But most of them are not. What happens is this fuzzy thinking. They have to get through all of these dendrites 
to come up with an answer. And then keep in mind the social pressures. Right? So when you ask your son, did you take the trash out before you went out, not only is he having the hard time having this fuzzy thinking, he's also thinking about, if I don't say yes, I might not be allowed to go to that party tonight. Right? And that girl I really like is at that party tonight. So the social pressures come on, and sometimes we get answers that may not be fully true. And so in that true and false quiz, we talked a little bit about lying. And when we ask adolescents to stop and think before they answer us, and not letting them give us that quick, impulsive, fuzzy answer, and you might even say something as clear as, I'm going to ask you a couple questions. But I want you to sit down, because sitting down calms us down a little bit, and I want you to count to three before you answer me. Now maybe I've made a little bit clearer decision. So blossoming is a fantastic opportunity to learn new things, but it also leads to adolescents making some very poor decisions. Right? Think about that teenager who's at a party Friday night, right? and the guy that they went with is like the guy they really like, and he's really cool and cute and everything, and they're having a great time, then he starts drinking. Uh-oh, he's supposed to drive me home. And then the end of the night comes and he says, Heather, come on, get in the car with me, we're gonna go home. Uh-oh, I really, really like him and I don't want him to think I'm a loser. I don't want to be embarrassed. I should probably get in the car with him, but I know if I get in the car with him, I might get hurt. Well, I could call my mom, but my mom will kill me if I'm with someone that's drinking. So I got all of these things to think about without being able to think very clearly that, hey, this is a really bad decision. You know what, I'm not gonna get in the car with him. I'm just gonna make up an excuse and tell him I gotta go with somebody else, no big deal. Hard to think like that when we have blossoming happening. So often leads to poor decisions, fuzzy thinking in adolescence. So that's the first part, blossoming. After blossoming, just like your garden, what comes next? Oh, yes, pruning. And here's what happens. The, nor the dendrites that you don't use, you lose. All right, so if you took two piano lessons and you never played the piano again, chances are those connections will become very weak. <coughs> if you play the piano twice a week for years, you're probably gonna form very strong connections. You start taking a second or a third language and you study it and you practice it, those connections get very strong. But if you don't study it and you don't practice it and you don't go to class, you lose those connections. So we have blossoming, then we start to lose some of these connections because we don't stay blossomed for very long. And we go back to the typical neuron. So whatever we don't use, we lose. Then, of course, comes myelination. I talked about myelination earlier today. Whatever we do over and over again becomes a strong connection. So the orange pipe cleaner up here, if you can see it, it's wrapped around the blue one. That's to represent myelination. When we repeat behaviors over and over and over again, they become myelinated or really, really strong, much harder to break a myelinated connection than one that's not myelinated. So again, whatever you do over and over again becomes a strong connection. Now during adolescence, this is a very sensitive time of development. Because if you're making healthy decisions and you are playing sports and spending time with good friends and playing music over and over again, that's what becomes myelinated. If during this time, with all of this to get through, you start to make connections like, gosh, every time I get stressed out, I'm just gonna smoke pot because it makes me feel calmer. That's what gets myelinated. So it also makes this time of development a high risk time for addictions because those connections, whatever children and youth are doing over and over again, will become myelinated. And so it's very important to let young people know that the decisions they make during adolescence are gonna become very strong connections in their brain. Whatever they're doing repeatedly, day after day after day, become those myelinated neurons. And as we learned early this morning with drawing the number six in the air, it's really hard to unlearn things. Really hard. So the decisions that young people make now can affect the rest of their lives, can absolutely change the rest of their lives in the way that their brains work. And then finally, when we talk about adolescence, we can't leave out hormones, but it's not all about hormones. Hormones play a big piece, but these other things also play a big piece. 
And the key thing with hormones is that we can predict what's going to happen. It seems like hormones are raging and out of control, but we know that's going to happen. And when we're aware of that and plan for that, it might not be as problematic. So when it comes to hormones, boys have a significant increase in testosterone, girls significant increase in estrogen and progesterone, and in the amygdala, for boys, the amygdala is overstimulated, overactive, and for girls, it's very unstable. So if you think about some of the adolescent girls that you know, perhaps they are sometimes moody. <laughs> Mood swings, unstable moods, that's because of the amygdala. Boys are more likely to engage in aggressive acts because that increase in testosterone. Girls have an amplification of emotions. If you happen to know some teenage girls, you might say to them, hey, you know, um, I saw that you left your coat in the car. Would you mind going to get that before I leave? Why are you so mean? <laughs> oh. right? Or they watch a sort of funny movie and they're hysterically laughing. Everything is amplified during this time of development. Girls also experience more cortisol, less serotonin during this time of development, along with an increased appetite. So during adolescence, girls are physically eating more most of the time. Their bodies are changing. They're gaining weight. They're stressed. They're sad. Put that all together. Add in media, magazines, television. Not uncommon to have girls develop eating disorders during this time of development. And here's a big piece of the reason why. OK, so now that we know what's going on in the brain, what do we do about it? Well, I have seven strategies to share with you before we break for lunch. Our first strategy is to teach teens about their brains. I think that most of you, from my quick view, are adults. This information should get to the young people that you work with. They need to know what's going on in their brains. They need to know that there are some things that are going to get easier for them. Their frontal lobes are still a work in progress. They're not going to always learn from their mistakes, make good decisions. They need to know that. And they need to know why you're hovering over them, why you're constantly telling them how to do things differently. Because you're doing your job. Just like learning to drive, you don't send a child out in a car to drive the very first time and then never go back again. Same thing with brain development. That's why we have adults, why we have parents and teachers and mentors and counselors. Because kids need us to have healthy brain development. So teaching kids how their brain works and teaching them that they're in control of a lot of what happens. They're not in control of what they were born with. But from there on out, the choices that they make can change their brains. And there's a course that I teach to kids, and that's one of the most important pieces that I feel like kids leave with is that the choices that they make, even in fourth grade, can start to change their brain. The fact that they choose not to exercise, they choose junk food over healthy food, can change their brains. So we want to teach them how to care for their brains, how to think better. There's a My Awesome Brain course that we can come into the school and teach to kids, but really giving them that understanding of what's going on in their brains and how to help them. The second strategy is not quite so easy. And that's to not take adolescents personally. Most, actually this morning, as I was driving out here, there was, if anybody listened to 93.1, there was a discussion on the radio this morning about how hard it is to not take other people's actions personally and to not think that it's all about us. And that's what happens so often in adolescence. Now that we understand what's going on in the adolescent brain, we can see that it's not about us at all. They have a hard time controlling their emotions. What's going on in their brains makes them very unstable at times, hard time predicting consequences. All that's going on has nothing to do with us. In addition, teenagers have a very hard time reading facial expressions and body language. So from an adult to an adult, we may be able to read and say, ooh, he is having a bad day. I am going to stay away from him today. Adolescents have a very hard time. So they may come running up to you, hey, what's up, how you doing? And we want them to be able to read our body language. But that's not something they have a very good time doing. So those over-blossomed brains, while it's a good time to learn new things, 
can often make communication and relationships a lot harder. So we want to try our best to remember what's going on and not to excuse inappropriate behavior, but to understand why it happens. And it's not because they're trying to like make our lives miserable, but they're dealing with a time of development that can be very, very challenging. Okay, our third strategy is sense and meaning. I mentioned this morning that the brain learns best when things make sense. And so when we can ignite and engage the hypothalamus, the what's in it for me, there's a much better chance that children will learn and remember. So here's a strategy that whether you are a parent or a teacher, I challenge you to try with your students next school year or this summer if they're still learning something new. These are the two questions that you want the young people to try to answer when they're learning new things. How does this information relate to what I already know? And how am I going to use it in the future? And that engages the hypothalamus, the what's in it for me. Because if I have nothing to relate this to, I'm gonna have a very hard time following you. And if I think I'm never gonna use this information, I don't care about what you're gonna say. But when I can start to make those connections, I can relate this to something. When I taught you the brain organs, I related them all to something you already know. The mail carrier, the palace guard, the what's in it for me. And then, hopefully, you started to make the connections of how you might use this information in your own lives, professions, personal home lives. So those are the two questions. All right, number four. This one's a little bit harder to explain. It takes a little longer. We want to adopt the language of the brain. And we have an entire workshop just on language. But here we're going to cover two pieces that we want to the actual words that we choose as adults can change kids. And the first one comes from Carol Dweck's work about mindset. And what Carol Dweck says is don't tell your kids they're smart. And for many of you that are parents in the audience, you're going, well, why not? I've been doing that for 20 years and it's working just fine. My parents told me I was smart. I told my son they're smart. I don't buy into this. Well, Carol Dweck did 30 years of research on this. And what she found was pretty astounding. What she found is that there are really two schools of people. There are fixed mindset and there are growth mindset. And that mindset comes from the way that the adults in your life talk to you. And so the first mindset, which is the fixed mindset, are individuals that believe that intelligence is a fixed trait. And so let's imagine little children who are told all the time by their parents and teachers, oh, Mary, you are so smart. You are so good at that. Oh, you didn't even have to work. And look at that amazing project you made. And they start to hear that, and those connections become real. And they start to make the connection, well, gosh, everything that I'm really good at is kind of easy. And so when things aren't really easy and I really have to struggle and work hard, that must mean that something is wrong with me because I'm smart. I'm not supposed to mess up. And so these individuals believe that intelligence is a fixed trait. We only have so much of it. But when I have to struggle and when I mess up and I make mistakes, that must mean that I'm not very smart anymore. And this is the mindset we want to avoid. These are the individuals who become adults who say, oh, no, I'm not good at math. I don't do math. Math's not my thing. I stay over here in the language arts department. That's my thing. I don't try those things that I'm not good at because I don't like to fail. I don't like to struggle. I like to continue to do the things that are easy for me. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, we have the growth mindset. And this is what we're aiming for. These are individuals who believe that intelligence is malleable. We can always do things differently. When you have a growth mindset, you believe that when you mess up and you make a mistake, it's not attributed to the fact that you're dumb, but it's attributed to the fact that you either had a lack of effort, 
a lack of persistence, or maybe you did the wrong strategy. Now next time you can do it differently. If you want more information on Carol Dweck's work, her book is actually called Mindset, and she has numerous studies in it. But I just wanted to highlight one of them so you can see what happens. The red line up there are our growth mindset kids, and the blue line are our fixed mindset kids. All of the kids were given a math problem that was considerably harder than what they should be able to do. So they were purposely given a math problem way too hard for them. And then they were given problems that they should be able to do. Well, when the kids that had that fixed mindset messed up, because they knew they were going to mess up, they gave up. They gave up and they didn't keep going because they were afraid to fail again. Our growth mindset kids were actually motivated to continue trying harder and harder. So don't we want to develop that mindset for kids to be okay with messing up and go back and try it again? And so I am not saying stop praising kids. But instead of saying, oh, you're so smart, try things like, wow, you really, really studied hard for that exam. I saw that you stayed in last night while all your friends were outside. You spent hours and hours. You really put a lot of effort into that. Wow, you know what? I saw that you tried all those different strategies to get that math problem right. You were really focused on working on that. I'm really proud of you. So we're being more specific and we're praising on perseverance, on effort, and on strategies instead of just that blanket statement of you're so smart. And I am a fixed mindset person. Right? I was raised by two wonderful parents who really thought they were doing the right thing and every day I'd come home from school and they'd say, oh, Heather, you're so smart. And that worked great until third grade. <laughs> yep, I grew up on Long Island. I went to a little Catholic school and I was top of my class. Right? I got A's on everything. School was a piece of cake for me. And so I thought that school was supposed to be easy because it had been until third grade. And my parents would praise me and praise me and praise me. And then, March of third grade, <laughs> I took a religion test. And picture it, right? Here we are, little Catholic school in the early 80s. I have my loose leaf paper. I have my Dixon Ticonderoga number two pencil. <laughs> right, I've listed one through 20 on the left-hand side, and I'm answering the questions. And I know that I didn't study. I didn't put in the effort that was necessary to get a good grade. I forgot we were having a test. So I knew that I did horribly. And I was stressed beyond belief because I had never failed before. And I come back to school the next day, I go to my religion class and they hand out the papers and there in the top right hand corner in red ink is an F. That was my first F. And I remember it clearly because the emotion involved, that's my amygdala, was very, very significant. I was devastated. I thought at the age of eight, you might as well pull me out of school, put me in the basement. I am never going to amount to anything. You told me for eight years I was smart. You were wrong. I am dumb. Look what I did. I failed. And then it gets worse. So you know, in elementary school, you have to bring your test home to get signed. But I'm petrified to show my parents what a failure I am, to disappoint them. And so I took my number two pencil, and in the top right-hand corner, underneath that F, I wrote in my third grade handwriting, Colleen Higgins. That's my mom. All right. So I bring it back the next day, and I say, hello, Sister Mary. Here's my test. Now, Sister Mary was a smart woman. She knew that that wasn't my mom's signature. Now, down to the principal's office I go. Now, not only am I dumb, and a failure, but now I'm going to hell. <laughs> so, this Catholic school, you know what that does to us. But I tell you that story to help you understand that I'm not saying that you can never tell your kids they're smart, but try to not develop that mindset in young people. Because we want young people who are all okay making mistakes. I messed up, I didn't study. What could I do differently? I could have gone to my teacher and said, you know what, I forgot to study. Is there any way I can take a makeup test? Can I do extra credit? Next time I'm going to do things differently. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with me. I made a mistake. 
And that's the mindset we want to develop in our young people. That struggle is okay. Struggle is necessary for growth. Not that everything has to come easy. Because at some point in our lives, whether it's in third grade or whether it's in your last year of medical school, you're gonna mess up. You're gonna make a mistake and things are gonna get hard. And you need to be able to deal with that struggle and that growth mindset enables you to be able to do that more comfortably and not to just stay away from things that are hard. And the growth mindset and the fixed mindset last for a really long time. Anybody in here ever taken a Zumba class? Mm -hmm. I took one. <laughs> yep, one. I will never go back. If you don't know what Zumba is, it's a dance exercise class where you are shaking things you didn't even know you had. Mm. And I felt so uncoordinated and I felt like everyone was staring at me and I was so nervous and I know no one was really staring at me, but I couldn't get past that. And I still struggle to do things that I know that I'm not very good at. And I know now I attribute that to that fixed mindset. I'm much more comfortable staying in areas that I know that I'm good at. And you wanna have kids who one day take Zumba classes. <laughs> All right, one other piece when it comes to language this has more to do with our executive functions. And here, this comes from George McCloskey's work. And what George McCloskey has done, and um, again, this is a whole separate workshop, but I just want to touch upon it, is he's looked at the actual language that adults use with their children, and he's shown us that some of the things that we may say may stimulate the frontal lobes, which is what we want, and some things that we say stimulate the amygdala a palace score, which is not what we want. Unless the children that you are working with are in danger, we don't want to stimulate the amygdala. Right? If your child is walking out into traffic, by all means, scream. Scream at them, panic, flip out, because that's going to make them react. But if you're trying to teach them history, do not scream at them. That's not going to work screaming at kids, using terminology that's going to stimulate their amygdala is going to make learning very hard. Now, I know you can't read that. Um, but if you are interested in getting a list of all of these prompts, what stimulates the frontal lobe versus the amygdala, send me an email. And we have it um, as a PDF. I'm more than happy to send it to you. I'll give you my email. Um, it's, just, well, it's just Higgins at UpsideDownOrganization.org. And it's on, if you go to our website, I'm very easy to find on there. But the idea behind this is that the words we choose can really prevent learning. I'll give you some real life examples that you can read. This was a real example in a kindergarten classroom that I heard last school year. Last spring, I was walking through a hallway and I actually heard a teacher say to a kindergarten student, Mia. Why aren't you looking at the board? Does Jaden look like the board? Ever hear something like that? Mm -hmm. So what happened in Mia's brain? Learning stopped. Her frontal lobe shut down. Her amygdala, uh-oh, I'm in danger. Somebody's yelling at me. She's embarrassed me. I'm humiliated, is off. When our amygdala is going crazy, we are not learning. So what that adult said just stopped her learning. What she could have said in a very calm tone, which I know is hard to do over and over and over again, but think about what happens in the brain is, Mia, you should be looking at the board right now. It's very clear. You've said exactly what you need her to do. The emotion is removed from it, and you're helping her frontal lobe to make those connections. Oh, yeah, I'm supposed to be looking at the board right now. When we get our own emotions involved, and when we escalate, kids are going to escalate. And when they're thinking with their amygdalas, it's very hard for learning to occur. Just one other example. This is more about a home situation. And this was a uh, family group that I was seeing for therapy. And the kid would tell me all the time the things that his parents would say to him. Something like, why isn't your game away yet? I told you you had 15 minutes to play. Amygdala stimulated there. You're yelling at me. I don't know what 15 minutes is. What I could say differently to help those frontal lobes engage is it's time to put your game away. And I know sometimes we feel like broken records because we're saying it over and over again. 
but that's what the brain needs. The same is true with sarcasm. Adults often use sarcasm with young people and it's often lost or misunderstood. And again, when that happens, the amygdala's going, oh, did he just make fun of me? I'm not really sure what he was saying. I don't get it. Everybody's laughing. They're laughing at me. And again, learning is going to stop. We want to create emotionally safe environments. When we use these words, we're taking away that emotional safety. Our fifth <clears throat> strategy has to do with empathy. We want to teach kids empathy. Many people think that empathy is a natural trait that human beings are born with. Neuroscientists believe differently. Neuroscientists believe that empathy is not a skill or a trait that human beings are born knowing how to do. It's something that we have to teach them. Now, some people have been modeled empathy in their homes and lives their whole childhood and adolescence. It looks like it comes naturally to them, but really what they're doing is they're mirroring what they have seen from their parents. So the social conditions that we grow up with can actually impact our genetic expression. They can change the way that our brains develop. Look at this father and son. Now that baby's just a few weeks old and he can mimic what his father is doing. It's not because his hippocampus is telling him what to do or his cerebellum is kicking in. Those are mirror neurons. We're just copying what we see. And from a very young age, that's how we learn. We copy what we see around us. So if you want kids who are good at empathy, you have got to show them empathy. You want kids who have patience, we've got to model and show them patience. What we do is going to impact what they do. Kids are going to mimic what we do. Also, we know that the social conditions that kids grow up in have a great impact on their brain. This was a study done by Paget and Sheridan back in the 90s that's still extremely relevant today. There was a large group of mice. They broke into three separate groups. The first group of mice just hung out in their happy little cage for 30 days. The second group of mice were physically restrained for 12 hours a day. Now, if you're a mouse lover, this is not a pleasant study, but better to do it on mice than children. So the second group of mice were physically restrained for 12 hours a day. The third group of mice were moved to different cages every three days. They were all mixed up with different families, different mouse families. After 30 days, all of the mice in all three groups were given a virus. And then they wanted to see what percentage of each group would die. Again, we study mice and rats and rodents. Their brains have many similarities to humans. And if we did these things to children, we would go to jail. So again, what do you think happened? One group had eight, one group had 15, and one group had 70. Which group do you think had 70? Turn to a neighbor and tell your neighbor, which group do you think had 70, A, B, or C? If you said C, you are correct. Now this study was actually done to look at the impact of physical restraint on the brain and body. So the scientists were quite surprised when they saw the results. Now the difference between the control group and the restrained group is significant, it's twice as much. But then look at the social reorganization. And when we think about human beings, the children that we care about, how often are our kids socially reorganized? For kids who are in care, who are moving from foster home to foster home to group home to group home, and every time they move, they go to a new school, that is extremely stressful. Now, not only does that increase our stress, remember they were all given a virus. It wasn't the stress that killed them. They were all given a virus. It also impacts our immune system. So any power that you have, whatever your role in life is, to decrease the social instability in the kids that you work with, the better off they will be. Now, of course, safety comes first. If children are in placements that are unsafe, move them. But if they are safe there, do everything in your power to increase that social stability because it changes genetic expression. 
it changes our immune system. And we want kids to be healthier, not worse off like these mice were. So what we want to do is we want to create environments with pro-social climates, clubs, mentoring, matching kids up with adults in their lives who care about them, check in with them on a regular basis, and have kids who are in programs where nobody goes unnoticed. It's unfortunate that in many programs, there are kids that nobody has a connection with. And we want to stop that from happening. Because when kids have that relationship and they feel connected, that's when change occurs. We need that relationship. Relationships are key. OK, we are on our sixth strategy. We have just a few minutes before lunch. So our sixth strategy I'm going to send you home with as a tool to use and play with your friends. And our sixth strategy is the survival game. And our survival game works like this. We know that the teenage brain has fuzzy thinking, right? We know it's blossomed, it has fuzzy thinking. So we want to help kids to make good decisions and to think clearly. So when we practice making good decisions, there's a much better chance we'll be able to use them in real life. So the survival game works like this. You create vignettes. You can use mine. You can create your own, which would be much better. Ask young people to create their own vignettes of real life scenarios that they have encountered that were hard for them, stressful for them. And you write these little scenarios down on index cards. You get a group of kids. You hand out the scenarios to the kids. They get together, read the cards out loud, and then they brainstorm ways to handle these situations. And the reason you do this is that by brainstorming solutions, you are creating connections, right? You go to a party, the guy you came with is drinking, what are you going to do? Well, if I'm there in the moment, I'm going to have a hard time. If I've talked about this and I come up with a solution to these potential situations, that connection is there. I can go back to it and my brain's like, oh yeah, this is what I'm going to do. My parents told me that no matter what, I can call them and they're not going to be mad at me. I'm going to go back to that connection. My boyfriend, my girlfriend's pressuring me to have sex. I don't want to have sex. What am I going to say? And save face. Because that's really important for adolescents. What we say as adults might not be the right answer for them. So it's working with their peers to come up with those answers, practice the solutions, and then when the real life scenarios happen, they have that answer to go to. And if they can't come up with answers, that's where, why you're involved in this conversation. Because you, as the adult, helps them to come up with some possible solutions. So that's the survival game. I have a lot of examples on here. They'll all be on the example that you have, the handout. All right, our final strategy. Our final strategy might seem sort of basic, but it's key. It's not to forget the fundamentals, how important exercise, nutrition, sleep, and coping skills are. Exercise is critical to healthy brain development. We need exercise for our brains to develop on time. And exercise turns on the attention systems in our brains. For children who have issues with hyperactivity and impulsivity, when they exercise, those symptoms decrease. There are many, many studies done on schools that have recess versus schools that don't have recess. And children that get to engage in recess and running and playing are better able to focus after they attend recess and do better academically after recess. So exercise is, is a key to healthy brain development. And exercise does some great things for our brain. It increases the birth of new brain cells. And it produces a chemical in our brains called BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor. It's like miracle grow for our frontal lobes. So if you have kids who have frontal lobe issues, whether it be ADHD or executive function disorders, we want to have them engage in exercise. And exercise does not mean only sports. Absolutely not. The power of play is its whole own category. Exercise in sports is great. PE class, little league, soccer camp, all that's great. But that's not the same as play. Play does something completely different for the brain. It allows openness and creativity. It is not adult guided. It is child guided. So sometimes we have families 
who have piano lessons on Monday and Wednesday and French lessons on Tuesday and soccer on Thursday and whoa, when do kids get to be kids? One of those nights, if not more than one, needs to be about play. Just relax, have fun, be creative. And as human beings, we have a lot to learn from the animal kingdom when it comes to play. Right, as human beings in most counties, after elementary school, we take away recess. So someone decided that at the age of 11 or 12, we no longer need play. Now we can sit in school for six hours and learn all day. Well, I think that's a mistake. And there are many schools that are cutting out PE programs, cutting out recess, cutting out after school sports, where kids are getting exercise or getting play. Now let's think about what animals do. They play forever. I go to a dog park, you'll see that 13-year-old German Shepherd, one ear, limping around. <laughs> but she's trying to get that ball, because she's still playing. The picture that you see up there was taken in the tundra by a group of photographers who were there for work. And as they were sitting around their campfire one night, they had a team of huskies with them, and there came a polar bear. And the polar bear started walking up to them. Now, being photographers, they thought, hey, let's take some pictures. And they thought those huskies were going to be goners. So there they had their cameras. And within a matter of moments, they started to play. <laughs> it's a true story. Look it up. You can read all about it. But for me, it's just a constant reminder that everyone needs to play. It's a critical part of brain development. It's a necessary ingredient for all human beings. And we all need to take time and make time to play. It is 11.45. We have a lot of people, and we have a lot of lunch to eat. I have a few more slides. I'm going to get to them after lunch. So I'm going to break here, and I will see you back after lunch.